watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Shona Bhattacharya. Here are our top stories this hour. Not much enthusiasm in Djibouti as few voters cast their ballots this Friday. Ismail Omar Gela is expected to win a fourth term and prolong his 17 years in power. A divided opposition has little hope for its five candidates. Confusion in Madagascar. The cabinet handed in its resignation to the president this Friday, but the prime minister denies he's stepping down. Our correspondent in Antananarivo will have more. And making history Olympic style, Kenya's female rugby team will be going to Rio this summer. It's the first time the women's version of the discipline will be featured at the Olympic Games. Early results are not in yet, but the outcome of Djibouti's election seems written in advance. A part of the opposition boycotted the polls this Friday as Ismail Omar Gele is expected to win a fourth term. Just 187,000 people, a fifth of the population, are eligible to vote in this tiny nation on the Horn of Africa that's the Red Sea's largest port and where some 60 percent of the population is unemployed. From Djibouti, Duncan Woodside reports. A polling station in an affluent area of the capital. Many people in this district support the regime. Mekio Khamed, a civil servant, believes there's much to thank the president for. He's brought peace and stability to Djibouti. It's he who has made Djibouti a destination courted by investors from across the entire world. Running for a fourth consecutive term, Ismail Omar Geller voted late morning. He displayed the confidence of a man set to remain in charge. We came to vote and now we're awaiting the results this evening with optimism. By early afternoon, the USN party was crying foul play. There were some anomalies. Some of our delegates were expelled from certain polling stations. As the polls closed, the African Union corroborated the absence of opposition observers in some areas, but cautioned it's not necessarily due to systematic obstruction by the security forces. What we found is that in many polling stations there were fewer than six delegates. Therefore, all candidates did not have their delegates. But why not? This is what we're currently examining. The conduct of the poll was always likely to be contested, given the opposition's long-standing lack of confidence in the Electoral Commission. The question now becomes how deep and prolonged the fallout. Conflicting reports coming out of Madagascar this Friday. According to the president's office, the cabinet and prime minister tended letters of resignation. Local media had been reporting tensions between Prime Minister Jean Ravello Narivo and the president. Ravello Narivo is the country's second prime minister in two years. Madagascar's political establishment is still shaky following a 2009 coup d'etat. From Antana Narivo, the capital, here's Gael Borgia. Today we saw the resignation of the government and then the non-resignation of the government in a very, very short period of time. Earlier today, um, President's staff called an urgent presser to make a major announcement, uh, the resignation of the Prime Minister and his government. And a few hours later, another presser was called by the Prime Minister himself, uh, who denied the information. Here is what he said. Je pas encore déposé ma démission. I haven't yet resigned, but given the circumstances and taking into consideration the national interest and my willingness to serve Madagascar and not to take advantage of it, I'm going to give him my letter of resignation whenever is most appropriate. The Prime Minister didn't want to say why he was asked to resign. He didn't want to say either when exactly he would give his resignation letter. Uh, so far, we have no explanation uh, for this sudden change of government and for this misunderstanding between uh, the Prime Minister and the President. 
Just a couple of days to go before Chadians head to the polls. 13 candidates are running in the presidential election, including incumbent Indris Deby, who has been in power for 26 years and is hoping for a fifth term. Among his main rivals are opposition leaders who complain of unfair voting procedures. Five civil society leaders have been arrested in recent days. Four of them are on trial for attempting to disturb the peace. Tensions are running high, as Luke Brown reports. It's the final straight for Idris Deby and one of his last rallies in this, his fifth presidential campaign. The sole objective, deliver a knockout blow to his rivals. The gamble is to win the elections in the first round. Deby has faced criticism for holding on to power for over 25 years. Chad's president argues, though, that he's the only man capable of ensuring peace. The people of Chad are showing that they think there is no one better than me to continue to bring change to this country, restore the democratic state, and above all, ensure the stability that's essential for Chad and for the region as a whole. In the ranks of his supporters, few doubt that their champion will prevail. I'm confident because he's backed by an alliance of more than 108 candidates and us young people are behind him. I came to back my candidate. I want him to win the first round with 100%. Preventing that first round victory is the principal objective for his adversaries. Salah Kinzabo leads a field of 12 opposition candidates. As he returns from the campaign trail, Gonzalo's supporters give him a hero's welcome on the outskirts of N'Djamena. We're going to show that without Debbie, the country will be even more stable. Because in reality, Debbie's stability is the stability that comes from the barrel of a gun. He took power by force. He has held Chad hostage for 25 years with a gun for every Chadian. And that isn't peace. Indeed, that's a sentiment echoed by many young supporters who have known nothing but life under Idris Deby. Our parents suffered and we are suffering now. We can't cope with it. Genzavo is the only solution to real change in Chad. This is the last uh, official day of the campaign and the streets of uh, N'Djamena, the capital uh, of Chad, have really been invaded by uh, the cortege of support uh, for the various candidates. The opposition, though, uh, has no single unifying candidate and uh, that could well pose a, a risky strategy uh, faced with uh, Idris Deby, the president, for over two and a half decades. Between relief and outrage, Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto, spoke out about the International Criminal Court's decision to abandon a case against him this week. The presiding judge noted a, quote, troubling pattern of witness interference. Ruto and his co-accused faced charges of murder, forcible deportation and persecution relating to post-election violence in 2007. 1,300 people are believed to have died and 600,000 others were left homeless in the worst wave of violence in Kenya since independence. Ruto defended his innocence. The allegations that were made against me were criminal acts of evil minds. We will not rest or relent or tire until every victim of the post-election violence is attended to. Preparing for victory, Kenya's women's rugby team will be competing at the Olympics in Rio this summer. It's the first time the sport will be featured as an event for women, and Kenya's lionesses are counting their lucky stars and hoping to make it to the podium. Lauren Bersticker has the story. It was thanks to a stroke of luck that Kenya's women rugby team qualified for the Rio Olympics. And while they're far from being favorites, the lionesses are already relishing the challenge. I mean, everyone thinks we're the underdogs, but I believe we can make it. It was South Africa that originally qualified for the competition after winning the African Championship in December. But the country's sports federation decided to forfeit, paving the way for Kenya's participation. 
For these players, it's an unprecedented opportunity to prove themselves in the field, but also to promote a sport that many Kenyans still feel is reserved for men. In our country right now, um, there's a lot of awareness of women's uh, rugby, which wasn't, which wasn't there. Yeah. Actually, you tell someone you play rugby, they're wondering, what is rugby? Do ladies play? Right now, you tell them you play, and they're like, oh, yeah, they're the ones who are going for Olympics. So it's created that awareness and that perception and that mindset. Women's rugby will, for the first time in history, become an Olympic discipline in Rio, setting the perfect stage for the Kenya Lionesses to showcase their fighting spirit. Good luck, ladies. That's the end of this edition. There's more news coming up on France 24. Stay with us. Revisited. April 21st, 1960. Brasilia is declared the new capital of Brazil. In less than four years, in the heart of the Amazon jungle, it becomes a symbol of modern, futuristic architecture. An utopian political project promising a better life and jobs for all. But time has taken its toll on the capital city. Social and economic inequalities, transportation problems, overpopulation are pushing the city to the brink. For so many inhabitants, the promise of those early days appears distant. Has Brasilia lost the power to inspire? Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.